do be do 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 Good afternoon and welcome to the subcommittee on planning dispositions and concessions. I am council member Ben Kalos, the chair of this subcommittee. You can tweet me at Ben Kalos. Uh, we are joined here by uh, council member Ruben Diaz Sr. and uh, council member Inez Barron. Today we'll be holding hearings on two projects with several applications, land use items 326, 327, and 328. 461 Alabama Avenue and three, land use item 329, East Village Housing, ANCP. If you're here to testify, please fill out a uh, white speaker slip with the sergeant at arms and indicate the land use number of the item used to testify on that slip. Our first hearing today is for land use items 326, 327, 328, 461 Alabama Avenue in Councilmember Barron's District in Brooklyn. The applications fill, filed by HPD will facilitate the development of a proposed seven-story mixed-use affordable and supportive housing development containing approximately 70 dwelling units and community facility space. 60% of the apartments will be for supportive housing for formerly homeless and remaining 40% will be affordable to those earning at or below 60% of AMI. I want to compliment my colleague on these numbers. I have not seen numbers like these in many other projects. And uh, she, my, my colleague is an outspoken advocate for affordable housing, uh, often asking affordable for whom and ensuring that it is actually helping communities versus gentrifying them. So I, I, I am impressed by her being such a strong advocate for community and delivering and acting on her word. The building's design will incorporate sustainable features to conserve energy, reduce environmental impacts, and promote the health of residents. The first application is for a special permit pursuant to Section 74-903 of the Zoning Resolution to modify the requirements of Section 24-111 to allow community facility bulk regulations to apply to a nonprofit institution with sleeping accommodations. HPD also seeks approval from an Urban Development Action Area Designation Project approval and disposition approval for Block 3803, Lot 6, and an amendment to the East New York 1 Urban Renewal Plan. I will now open a public hearing on land use items 326-327-328-461 Alabama Avenue. First, I'd like to invite Councilmember Barron to provide some remarks. Councilmember Barron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel this is a project in my district, and each time that developers come with projects, I'm always mindful of the fact that the median income in my community is about $34,000, dollars $36,000, which is about half of what is the AMI for New York City. So as developers come with their first initial offerings, it sometimes is not reflective of what it is that exists in my community at present. It's my belief that as the incomes that are required for housing developments coming into a community do not match what already exists, that you're encouraging either calling it gentrification or calling it ethnic cleansing. Or I've seen a new phrase now from the Federals, which is called poverty deconcentration. All of that to means that you're displacing people who presently live there, poor people and predominantly black and Latino people. So I'm always very concerned about maintaining the opportunity for people who presently live in the community to be able to now enjoy the um, benefits and, and the amenities that are coming in in new facilities. So this is a building that's a little taller than what I would normally uh, be comfortable with, but it is a building that does provide units for uh, the supportive housing population. And as has been said, there will be units set aside designated at 40% of the AMI, 50% of the AMI, and 60% of the AMI. And the additional height on this building beyond what I initially wanted to have was so that we could incorporate some one and two bedroom units. They wanted all studios, and I did not feel that uh, that kind of composition encourages family and building community. 
So they did make some accommodations, so we were able to settle on what we presently have. And I look forward to the project being um, approved and moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I'll now ask the committee council to uh, swear in the uh, large panel. Um, before, please say your name before answering the following question. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? Lacey Tauber, HPD, yes. Arlo Chase, Services for the Underserved, yes. Margarita Pajaro, sorry. Margarita Pajaro, CB Manual, yes. Brian Newman, Newman Design, yes. Teresa Cassano, HPD, yes. Should I get started? Yes, please. We're, wait we're waiting for IT when I guess. Okay, my part doesn't have okay. visuals, so I can go while they're doing that. Um, land use items number 326, 327, and 328 are related ULERP actions seeking UDAP designation, disposition and project approval, as well as a zoning special permit and an urban renewal plan amendment in order to develop a project located at Block 3803, Lot 6 in Brooklyn Council District 42. Known as 461 Alabama Avenue, the project will be developed under HPD's Supportive Housing Loan Program, or SHLP. Through this program, HPD funds the creation of rental units that provide supportive housing for the homeless, people with special needs, and other persons of low income. As part of the program, HPD works with the Department of Homeless Services and other public agencies to ensure that the completed projects receive appropriate building security and social services. The project site is a 10,000 square foot vacant city-owned site that was part of an HPD-issued request for qualifications geared towards certified MWBE organizations, inviting them to submit proposals to develop low-income rental housing. HPD selected the development team of CB Emanuel Realty, LLC, and Services for the Underserved, or SUS, in 2017 to develop the site as supportive housing with on-site services. Before ULERP certification, the sponsor met with uh, Councilmember Barron in her office three times in 2017 and most recently in October 2018. Um, as the council member mentioned, in response to her feedback as well as input from Brooklyn Community Board 5, the sponsor and HPD worked together to update the project to include multifamily units, a wider range of affordability tiers, and additional energy efficient design features such as solar panels. And thank you, council member, for your partnership on this project. Um, land use item number 327 seeks UDAP designation, project approval, and disposition of the site. The sponsor is proposing to construct a seven-story building with 70 rental units plus a unit for a superintendent. As is typical of the supportive housing program, 60% of the units, or 43 units, will be reserved for formerly homeless individuals, while 40% of the units, 27 units, will be non-supportive units that will be available through HPD Lottery. There will be a mixture of unit types, including 55 studios, 14 one-bedrooms, and two two-bedroom apartments. Targeted incomes for the affordable units will range from 40% to 60% of AMI, and all tenants, including formerly homeless tenants, will pay up to 30% of their income in rent. The proposed development will participate in Enterprise Green Communities program. Therefore, the design will incorporate sustainable features that conserve energy, reduce environmental impacts, and promote residents' health. Amenities will include, include a lounge and multi-purpose room, tenant storage, a laundry room, and an outdoor landscaped courtyard. The estimated total development cost is $28,132,000, which is subject to change. The permanent funding sources include HTC long-term bonds and an HTC second mortgage, together an estimated 29% of TDC. Tax credit equity, estimated 42% of TDC. Accrued and deferred construction interest, a deferred development developer fee and an HPD SHLP loan. The city subsidies are approximately $6,185,000 or 22% of TDC. The project has 43 NYC 1515 rental assistance vouchers to support rents for the supportive units. It will receive an as-of-right tax exemption under 420C. Please note that this building, er, this, sorry, that this budget is preliminary and subject to change as the project moves closer to closing. The on-site social services will be provided by Services for the Underserved, SUS, to include recovery-oriented case management for residents, daily life skills training, employment services, social, recreational, and cultural activities, substance abuse services, and 24-7 front desk security. 
The following actions are necessary for development of the project. Um, land use number 326 seeks a special permit of the zoning resolution in order to modify the maximum floor area ratio for certain community facility uses. The modification will apply to a nonprofit institution with sleeping accommodations in order to enable construction of the proposed development. Um, land use number 327, as mentioned above, seeks UDAP designation, project approval, and disposition of the site. Land use number 328 seeks approval of the, of the fourth amended East New York One Urban Renewal Plan, um, which will change the land use designation of 461 Alabama Avenue from open space to residential use. HPD is before the Council's Planning Subcommittee seeking approval of land use numbers 326, 327, and 328 in order to move forward with the next steps in the development process for the 461 Alabama Avenue Supportive Housing Project. And the development team is here and they have a presentation they'd like to go through now. Thanks, Lacey. Um, my name is Margarita pa uh, Bajaro. I'm Vice President of Development for CB Emanuel Realty, the co-developer on this deal. Um, Lacey already mentioned the land use actions, a UDAP designation, project approval and disposition, special permit, urban renewal plan amendment. Um, so I won't reiterate that, but uh, go into who CB Manual is. We are a 14-year-old um, development company, minority certified through the state and um, SBS. Uh, we've developed over 2,300 units uh, with a total of $400 million um, development costs. Uh, we were awarded this um, project through an HPD initiative for minority developers and we co-own um, a large project on the same block um, <clears throat> that straddles Georgia Avenue and Alabama Avenue. So as you can see, the project site um, is surrounded by multiple various uses, including um, the Success Garden across the street, um, an educational facility across the street diagonally, and um, I don't have a pointer, but it's, it's the, the block surrounded by the red lines right in the center of the, of the circle. Also, mid-rise uh, residential. Um, behind you as well. Oh, behind me as well. <laughs> Contiguous to, 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 the, um, to the lot. The lot is a 10,000 square foot lot between Dumont and Livonia. It has subway access um, on Pennsylvania um, on the three and Livonia Avenue on the L. As I mentioned, they're, they're buildings, um, residential buildings of uh, comparable height within a one block radius. The Success Garden is across the street. We have Lions Pride Playground, um, I think less than a quarter mile away, as well as Martin Luther King Jr. Playground um, in the immediate vicinity. Um, we've met with Council Member Barron multiple times. We appreciate her input. We highly respect her views and um, share uh, much of the same concerns um, for the community uh, since we own and manage there already. So thank you, uh, Councilwoman. Um, we met with the Land Use Committee of the Community Board 5 on uh, April 24, 2018, and the members provided their support in May of 2018. With, um, with the community engagement, um, it resulted in the inclusion of multifamily units, a wider range of AMI tiers, uh, additional energy efficient um, design. Uh, we're committed to providing um, greenery on an annual basis to the Success Garden um, across the street. And SUS um, has committed to use reasonable efforts to employ community members at the property. Um, we're also open to having commu the community use the uh, community rooms to the extent that um, it doesn't interfere with pr the programs going on at the building at the time. Uh, the unit mix, uh, we have 43 studios, all of which are 350 square feet or larger. Um, so 43 studios, uh, which would be the supportive units, and then the, the delta, um, will range from 40, 50, and 60% of AMI. And you can see the distribution on the, on the screen. And with that, I'll, I'll give the mic over to Arlo Chase of SUS, who will um, explain the services and, and their organization. 
Thank you, Margarita, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, Services for the Underserved is a 40-year-old not-for-profit organization that specializes in providing housing and social services for people with disabilities, people facing homelessness, and other life challenges. We have a pretty large portfolio of programs throughout the city with a concentration in Central and East Brooklyn, East Harlem, and the West Bronx. We have over 2,400 employees in our um, organization scattered throughout the city, and I'm proud to say that 130 of those employees call Brooklyn Community Board 5 home. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt. I just want to recognize that we've been joined by Councilmember Chaim Deutsch. Please continue. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the service model that we would be employing, that we expect to employ uh, at this building. Um, so we've applied for and been awarded uh, funding, social service and rental assistance funding through New York City's 1515 program. Um, so that provides uh, funds to employ uh, case managers and other service staff at the building, as well as rental subsidy for the uh, supportive tenants. So what we do is we begin all of our treatment with um, sitting down with the individual, these would all be individual supportive housing residents, and trying to come up with life goals for that person. As everyone in the room I'm sure can appreciate, dictating what a person should do to change their life has really been discredited as a service model. So what we believe is in people, person-centered, and self-directed care. So the goals for the folks that we uh, usually serve that are coming out of homeless shelters that have been there a long time usually include some combination of family reunification, uh, job or employment, uh, either enhancing or uh, obtaining, uh, as well as often some kind of drug or alcohol uh, recovery program. We have a very successful urban farms program that operates both to create healthy food at a number of the buildings we operate, as well as a therapeutic um, pastime for, for many of the residents. We would provide part of the uh, New York City 15 grant would provide uh, part of the funding to employ 24-hour security staff, um, which is one of the important features in large supportive housing buildings, uh, which operates both for the benefit of the residents as well as the surrounding community. We would have an extensive amount of video um, security cameras, both in the building and in the front of the building, uh, which are also a benefit both to the community as well as the residents. I think unless there are questions, I'll turn it over to uh, Brian. Thank you. Um, as you can see behind me, we have a, a rendering of the front facade on Alabama. What we tried to do here uh, was help break up the massing of the building. Uh, as we've stated before, it's a seven-story building. You can see floors six and seven are actually stepped back approximately 20 feet from the front facade. In addition to that, we took the two stair towers and we did not bring them all the way out to the front. So each one of those stair towers is approximately 18 to 20 feet stepped back on, on either side of the building. The whole building itself is additionally pushed back from the street line or sidewalk approximately three feet. Uh, this allows us to introduce uh, landscaping, foundation planting, and soften the, the appearance of the building to the pedestrian's experience as they walk by. Um, in addition to uh, enhance the pedestrian experience, we like to break up the facade on the ground floor. You can see some precast uh, piers that are, that are breaking up that massing. We have lighting there as well for security um, on, as the pedestrians walk by that front, that front facade. Um, you can see uh, in the main building we use a two-tone brick again just to accentuate the, the differences and, and uh, accentuate the, uh, the entrance on the right-hand side there. Uh, there's a uh, glass uh, canopy as well for the entrance. What you do start to see in, this, um, in the rendering at the very top, we have a public area for the residents um, to enjoy exterior space on the roof. Uh, it's a green roof 
And those elements that you start to see there are the photovoltaics or solar panels that we've mentioned before. We've actually elevated those so we can still utilize portions of the roof, but they can create shade for the residents if they're standing, uh, standing or sitting up on, on the roof there as well. This is a superimposed uh, floor plan and site plan. You begin to see the first floor plan here, uh, entrances on the right-hand side. Um, essentially, the first floor is raised approximately four feet from the street level, so ground floor apartments, uh, people walking by will not be able to see directly in. And we achieve accessibility by keeping the lobby at that ground floor level. You'll enter into that lobby past the security. Uh, there is an elevator directly there, which will take you up to that first floor of residential, which is approximately four feet higher. So it's so somewhat of a, a half, of, half stop for that elevator. Um, directly in that top right corner, you'll start to see some of the program. That is a, uh, a tenant lounge and computer lounge uh, that has access directly to the rear courtyard, which has some exercise equipment, uh, path, and planting, uh, planting area, garden area for the residents. Um, on the cellar level, on the left-hand side, is, a, is a, um, an areaway with step-back landscape walls where additional uh, programmatic uh, elements, such as the community room, the offices for SUS, are located on that level. But we've created, as I said, that step landscape wall so those uh, community areas are not simply looking to a solid uh, concrete wall only a few feet away. This is a, a typical residential floor, stairs on either side, uh, elevators on the right hand side there, double loaded corridor, and as we mentioned, uh, majority are studio units, but we have been able to incorporate one, uh, one bedroom and two bedroom units as well. And this is the roof plan, which I was starting to mention before. Right-hand side, the elevator comes out. The paved area is the area in which the uh, residents will be able to uh, walk around, uh, have some seating area, and the solar, uh, the hatched area in the center, that dotted on the area in the center in the top right and left corner, that's the green roofs or the vegetated roof area. And just below that large rectangle in the front would be the photovoltaics with benches just below that. Thanks, Brian. Um, so where we are on the timeline, uh, we, um, we certified for ULERP August 20th. Uh, we, um, the Community Board 5 issued recommendation to approve on October 17th. Um, the Brooklyn Borough President issued recommendation to approve uh, November 22nd. Um, City Planning Commission approved the project January 9th of this year. Um, and we are now in city council review. Um, we anticipate closing um, financing and for construction December of this year uh, with a construction completion of December 2021. Thank you. Thank you. This was one of the more complete uh, testimonies. I really appreciate that. It saves me a lot of the uh, questions. Who is the contractor you'll be using on this? We haven't gone out to bid yet. What are your, on this $28.1 million project, what are your hard costs? We, because we don't, we're, we have the assumption, but we don't have final, because we don't have, we don't have bids yet. The assumption right now is about 16.7 million. That is obviously very subject to change once Correct. we do get final pricing back. So that is a, that's 11.4 million in soft costs. Approximately with contingency, it would be about 17.5 million of construction costs all in. The soft costs are about 11, almost 12 million, yes. What is the developer fee on this project? That is still being negotiated. Uh, so, but it is within the uh, $12 million fee, the $12 million soft costs. Correct. It is subject to our term sheet restrictions and still a negotiation at this point. What is the term sheet restriction? 
Our term sheet restrictions for Supportive Housing Loan Program, and by the way, this is Teresa Cassano, I'm the director of the Supportive Housing Loan Program talking. Um, they require that the developer fee be within 15% inclusive of reserves. Generally, we see fees come in a little bit lower than that. Okay, but there's also a, a developer fee uh, concession and in, baked into this project has testified to. Deferred developer fee, I think you're referring to. Okay, so it's a deferral, so you'll take it later. Correct. Right. Okay. As you mentioned, it is a 60-year tax abatement. Do you happen to know what the value of that tax abatement is? Um, because this is an as of right uh, under this project, we don't calculate the value of the tax exemption the same way we do with the Article 11s when those are the council, um, when those are subject to council approval. I still believe that the council, that the city is giving up income, so it is still important to be aware of the tax income that we will be losing. Uh, What do you anticipate the uh, value of the low income housing tax credit to be? It's 22% 22 22 of the, sorry, the total subsidies are 22%. How much do you anticipate to get from the low income housing tax credits? So the low income housing tax credits are financing about 42% of the overall TDC at PERM. And so that equity is bringing in the lion's share of the funding on this project. And any federal or state funding? Beyond the low income housing tax credits, no, we are not expecting any federal or state funding at this point. And was this, this area is being rezoned? No, there's no, there's there's no rezoning. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the actions is a zoning special permit um, that modifies the FAR for community facility uses. Um, this is a nonprofit with sleeping accommodations, which is um, sometimes typical of our uh, supportive housing program. Um, However, the zoning itself does not change. It is correct. simply a special permit. So what would be allowed to be built here versus what is currently being built here? What, what, is, what is the status quo versus the change that you've made or that you're proposing? I don't have the as of right or, or smaller FAR in front of me, but what I could point out is where I, which might have been a 4.0, I, I believe, off the top of my head, we're only going for a 4.02 compared to the 4.8, which would actually be the total allowable buildable under the community facility if we were to completely max out that community facility Is regulation. it too late to add a, so I, I understand my colleague is concerned about the height and that this is taller. Um, so I, I imagine it's not something they would be interested in, but uh, if they had the, the additional 0.8 FAR, what would that, would that allow any additional units that, uh, or just this is where you are based on the height that you're trying to fit into? We've essentially maxed out the envelope height and discussing with a number of, of parties. Okay. Uh, my understanding is this was a bid that was won as a program for MWB, so I pl please uh, confirm my assumption that uh, y you are an MWBE? Yes. Uh, CB Emanuel, which is the lead developer, we are state, New York State, and SBS certified minority Re developer. And the architect, the engineers, the uh, folks doing the, the general contractor will also be MWBEs? The architect is not. Um, we, we take very seriously the minority and women and veterans set aside. On our deals, we've historically exceeded those carve-outs um, on, on our deals. So what the, the understanding will be that, um, or the expectation will be that the GC um, uh, higher from the community 
um, and and meet uh, the minimum set aside. So you're not minimum. currently planning for a GC that's going to be an MWBE. So you'll be the only MWBE on the project, except for like the target. That we you have. we haven't finalized our, our GC list yet. Uh, we don't have many MWBE general contractors. We know a lot of subcontractors. Do you think that if companies such as yours were steering business to M other MWBEs that there might be more? Sure. Okay. Uh, along those lines, uh, do, do you have health insurance, disability insurance, and a, an ability to retire? Uh, Sorry. Retire, do you, do you, through CB Emanuel, mm -hmm. do you have health insurance? Yes. Disability insurance? Yes. And uh, do you have a retirement vehicle, whether it's a 401k or? Yep. Is that going to be offered to everyone on the construction project from top to bottom? I can't speak to the general contractor and their subs and what they offer their laborers. Um, I know that a livable wage will be um, offered, but I can't speak to health. Um, do you think that they should? Uh, Okay. Uh, we can talk about okay. the supportive housing right. in a second, but do you okay. think that the folks who are doing the work on the construction site should have of course. access to the same health? Will you mandate that your GC and the sub subcontractors that you work with, <clears throat> and who are hopefully going to be MWBEs, offer their workers health insurance, disability insurance, and a retirement option? I can't, I can't speak on behalf of a general contractor we haven't chosen yet. But you you could say that as choosing that these are important values to you, you have it, right? And, and you want sure. it for your other employees at your company. Of course. Would you be willing to include in your uh, RFP that you would like your people <coughs> working on the site to have the same coverage as you? We could, we could discuss what that does as far as increasing hard costs. Um, and we could have a conversation about it. Um, whether the GC and the subs offer these plans uh, is one thing. Um, I, will they buy in? We can't speak to that. Um, I think we should revisit this, um, but I can't, I can't speak on behalf of a general contractor or subs that have not been identified. Uh, on the, when you said living wage, um, I think I'm concerned we may have a different definition of living wage. Do you define living wage as the state's minimum wage of fifteen dollars an hour? Well, that's the start, but general—I mean, general contractors pay above that per hour. Okay, so will there be anyone on this construction site earning minimum wage, or are you setting a different threshold of what you believe the living wage is? I think, just generally speaking, quickly, and this is Teresa Cassano again from the Supportive Housing Loan Program. The plan on this project is to wait until the construction documents are developed enough and then go out to a pool of bidders. And so it's hard to have these conversations when we don't even have that pool of bidders identified yet. Um, and so, you know, while we hear your points, this is very preliminary and it's hard to actually negotiate terms and costs when we don't have the bidders identified nor the documents ready for them to price. So, so I, I, my concern is just if you pay people minimum wage, then they're making $27,300 a year. And at that rate, they would be making half the AMI of your project, which would mean they were making the affordable housing crisis much worse. If you paid people $25 an hour, they would qualify for the affordable housing you are building. And so, if you paid the construction workers the wage rate that other construction workers make across the region, uh, then they wouldn't need the affordable housing. So my concern is just in constructing, you could make the affordable housing crisis worse. The standards, the standard of pay in the construction industry mm -hmm. tends to skew higher than the minimum wage. I could, I could say that generally. But I, as Teresa already pointed out, and as I've attempted to, to explain, without having a general contract li bid list, um, I can't even have those conversations with 
with with the with the GCs to to understand what that might do to the bids, which would then increase the overall development costs, which may go ahead and increase our ask for subsidy. I, I'm comfortable providing more subsidy if if the uh, mayor mayor is one of the things I've heard him say again and again is the best thing we can do to fight the affordable housing crisis is raise wages. Uh, for SUS, same same questions. All of our employees are entitled to health insurance as well as disability insurance. And those operating the building will have it? That is correct. And will they have retirement accounts? There is there is an option for a 403B. Currently, we do not have a match. OK, I, I would encourage you to do the match. Uh, and similarly, um, do, do you have a wage rate that is tied to others in the community doing similar work? I'm not necessarily following the question. I apologize. Uh, if you have somebody who's doing social work with uh, your your clients, um, some social workers are part of an agreement where their compensation is tied to other social workers at other sites throughout the city. Uh, and so the question is whether or not your social workers have a salary that is tied to a citywide or to other sites, or if they are just set at whatever rate you want. We have uh, a range of salaries that are set for our organization. I do not believe they're tied to uh, other organizations, as you suggest. Um, but uh, okay. I, I can tell you the, the, the lowest wage for the people we'd expect to employ would be $40,000 a year annually. That is, that is what I was looking to hear. That is good. Uh, I think they would still end up qualifying for this affordable housing, uh, but it is, it is much in better improvement. Uh, and then I think the, the favorite piece I like to ask folks is uh, for the developer, uh, you have a local hire requirement. If somebody is watching this and they're a council member Barron's district and they have would like a job building this building, uh, who can they call to get that job? What number do they dial if they're watching right now at home? Well, I don't have a phone number for them, but we will be coordinating with the community board once we have chosen the general contractor, and we will we're we're open to having a um, a uh, employment fair specific to this deal, and we've already said that to to councilman councilwoman Barron. So I will now turn it to my colleague for a comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My office number is seven one eight. 649-9495, 718-649-9495. And I just want to say that uh, there was some very um, productive negotiations that we engaged in. I think the team understood what, uh, what I thought would be best for our community, and they were willing to work to make sure that the final project achieved that. Um, the, the, height, the, the fact that it's a little higher was very pleasing to my chief of staff because she's always saying, well, people need housing. Mm -hmm. And also the incorporation of the uh, green features. We have the solar panels. So generally, I'm very pleased with it. Going forward, we want to make sure that we bring to reality all that we say we're going to do and meet all the goals that we've set. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, want to compliment Councilmember Barron. This is a very good project. It appears that the folks working in the building mm -hmm. will be doing well. Uh, sounds like you're going to have a fun job fair. Everyone now has your number to call and uh, make sure that they can get jobs on the site. Uh, do we have any further uh, members of the public who wish to testify? Seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on land use items 326, 327, and 328, and the application will be laid over. Our second hearing today is for land use item 329, East Village Housing ANCP in Councilmember Rivera's district in Manhattan. This application will facilitate the development of two new buildings containing approximately 21 units of affordable housing and commercial space. Out of the 21 units, 10 will become affordable cooperative units, 11 will be affordable rental units. HPD seeks approval for an urban development action area designation project approval and disposition approval for block 406, lots 6 and 47, located at 204 Avenue A and 535 East 12th Street. These sites are being developed under HPD's Affordable Neighborhood Cooperative Program. 
I'd like to now, uh, before we open the next public hearing, I'll turn back to Council Member Barron. I was remiss. I've got to give Brian Paul great thanks and acknowledgement for the great work that he always does and continues to do. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. I will now open the public hearing on land use item 329, East Village Housing ANCP. I would like to invite HPD to present its testimony. I will ask those on the panel to please state your names and then the uh, council will uh, administer the oath. Just before I start you guys in, I feel like some of you have not filled out a slip, so if you can just do it afterwards, that would be great. Um, but um, for the oath, um, would you please state your name before answering? Do you affirm to tell the truth? the whole truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and in all council members' questions. Christine Ratzoff O'Connell, HPD, I do. Genevieve Michael, HPD, I do. Uh, Juan Barahona, SMJ Development, I do. Kevin Paris, HPD, I do. You may begin. Uh, and I have copies here, if you. Yes, please. Uh, land use number two, uh, land use number 329 is related to the proposed ULERP action for a project known as East Village Housing. This ULERP action seeks urban development action area designation, disposition, and project approval for a development site cons consisting of two city-owned buildings located at 204 Avenue A, Block 406, Lot 6, and 535 East 12th Street, Block 406, Lot 47, in Manhattan Council District 2 that will be redeveloped under HPD's Affordable Neighborhood Cooperative Program, ANCP. As part of the ANCP program guidelines, city-owned multiple dwellings are conveyed to restoring communities HDFC for $1 per tax lot and then rehabilitated by private developers selected through a competitive process to create affordable cooperatives for low and moderate income households. The developer will sign a site development and management agreement with restoring communities that will be in, in effect until co-op conversion occurs and title transfers from restoring communities HDFC to a newly formed cooperative HDFC. From the time of the cooperative conversion, the developer, developer will remain the property manager for at least one year. After the first year, the co-op will have the choice of keeping the developer as property manager or hiring a new company approved by HPD. The two buildings under land use number 329 are multiple dwellings taken into city ownership in the late 1970s. In the early 2000s, the building entered into the tenant interim lease program, TIL, which required the tenants to form tenant associations to self-manage their buildings and collect rents under a net lease agreement with HPD. Both buildings were vacated due to structural integrity issues, so they are currently empty. Generally, buildings in ANCP undergo substantial rehabilitation. However, in this case, the building will be demolished and in their place, the developer, SMJ Development, will construct two new buildings, thus requiring ULERP. As a result of working with the occupants and council, HPD and the developer agreed that 204 Avenue A will become a fully cooperative building and the prior occupants will return. 535 East 12th Street will remain a rental under the ownership of the developer. The cooperative building at 204 Avenue A will be a seven-story building with eight one-bedroom and two bedrooms and one commercial space. The cooperative interest attributable to occupied apartments will be sold to existing tenants for $2,500 per apartment. Anticipated income targets for this building will be no less than 80% of AMI uh, for a one-bedroom, and the initial maintenance for existing tenants share and shareholders will be at 40% of AMI. Therefore, maintenance for a one-bedroom apartment will be $786 and $958 for a two-bedroom apartment. Uh, plans for the commercial unit have yet, yet to be determined. Uh, the rental building at 535 East 12th Street will be a six-story building with one studio and 10 one-bedroom apartments with no supers unit. Uh, anticipated income targets will be up to 40% of AMI for a one-bedroom. Uh, it's $109,620 per year with initial rents at uh, 130% of AMI, which is approximately $2,301 for a studio and $2,469 for a one-bedroom. Uh, both buildings will be fully accessible. Uh, the estimated total development cost for the new construction is uh, $14,226,128, which is subject to change. Uh, funding sources include $10,819,557 in city subsidies, which represents about 76% of the total development costs. Um, 
land use number 329 also seeks approval of Article 11 tax benefits for 204 Avenue A and 535 East 12th Street for 40 years that will coincide with the term of the regulatory agreement. The cumulative values totals approximately $6,369,526 and the net present value is $1,779,462. Uh, HPD is excited to move the project forward after extensive collaboration with both former Council Member Mendez and uh, current Council Member Rivera. Uh, as with many N ANCP projects, uh, the financial crisis in 2008 and problems with lending for home ownership as a result stalled this project, and we're glad to be on track without further delays. Uh, in order to facilitate the construction of East Village Housing, Pro Housing ANCP project, HPD is before the Council seeking approval of land use number 329. All right, great. I'm just going to run through this uh, this presentation that we've um, we've been making for a few years now with the community board and all the various stakeholders. Uh, so the, the the development team consists of um, really myself, uh, SMJ Development, I'm a Minority Business Enterprise certified by New York City SBS. Um, I think one of the few Latino developers that you probably see before you. Um, with any frequency. Um, I've hired Shakespeare Gordon Vlad. Oh, sorry. I'd like to recognize we've been joined by Council Member Vanessa Gibson. Please continue. Sure. I've uh, retained Shakespeare Gordon Vlado Architects, a uh, WBE that's certified by SBS and uh, New, York, New York State as well. And like we said, we're using Restoring Communities to act as the HTFC. Um, these are the actions. Uh, it's a very straightforward ULERP, uh, DISPO, and UDAP designation. Um, as was previously, state, previously stated, uh, these, you know, these projects have been around for a while. Uh, HPD has had them since the 70s. Um, and I guess, unfortunately, they were vacated, and so the tenants have been, quote unquote, temporarily, temporarily relocated since 2008. Uh, having talked and met with them for a few years now, they're very, very eager to get back, to, uh, get back home and have the project finally cross the finish line. Uh, from a zoning perspective, you've got Avenue A with an R7A designation with an on-site inclusionary option, and East 12th um, Street is an R8B, um, which are both, you know, uh, zoning zoning that zoning that was put in place in 2009 with the East Village Lower East Side rezoning. As you can see, these are these are photos of the properties on Avenue A. It's a four-story building that's been vacant, um, and the five-story building on uh, on 12th Street. Um, on Avenue A, we're, we're able to get a, a little, a little s slightly taller. Uh, we have seven stories with 10 apartments over about 1,000 square feet of commercial. The 10 cooperative units, uh, there's two two bedrooms and one, sorry, two two, two bedrooms and eight one bedrooms. The ground floor commercial uh, space, about approximately 1,000 square feet, will, retain, will uh, remain with the co-op and they'll have their open space on the, on the uh, roof level. On 12th Street, it's a six-story building with 11 apartments and no commercial area, and it's only six stories. Um, and uh, you know, Avenue A will be a cooperative, and you know, Christine, and my colleague here, are going to speak to to the ANCP restrictions and, and the purpose of the program, um, and then the maintenance levels, and then the 12th Street will be a middle-income rental, um, which will be subject to the, ho the Housing Connect program. And here's our, your typical layouts. They're 25 footers, so there's nothing really special uh, in terms of design here from a layout perspective. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you for answering so many of my questions ahead of time. I appreciate your flag and the fact that this has taken 10 years. Where have the residents been in the interim? And can you get into a little bit of the details it, I guess HPD shouldn't be, I guess, how does the financial crisis, how did the financial crisis stop HPD from moving this forward? It's, I, I don't believe we stopped doing affordable housing. So if I can get a little bit more details on A, where, were the ten, where are the tenants currently? Mm -hmm. When will they get to move into these new apartments? And then why did it take 11 years and with construction, I imagine, and how long is construction going to take? two years, so it's going to 13 years of diaspora. 
So the 10 residential families have been out uh, since 2008 due to structural instability. Um, they are relocated into other till properties, so other city-owned properties in the Lower East Side. Um, the tenants have been very participatory in this process. Uh, actually, in 2008, there really wasn't a development program for till properties. Um, we, we sort of tailed off or tapered off the, the program in 2006 um, uh, due to the costs associated with the renovation of these buildings. It's very substantial in most cases, and in this, this rare case, it's actually new construction. Um, and then 2008, we had the financial crisis. The Office of Management and Budget did not feel the comfort with financing these kinds of projects any longer due to the cost and also due to the fact that um, you know, financing for homeowners in, in the market really wasn't available. So uh, this program sort of uh, was at a stall. And in 2012, ANCP was born. Um, it was sort of a redraft of the TIL development program. Um, this project was actually assigned to SMJ in 2016. That's when we really got the program up and running. We had an RFQ list. SMJ was qualified. Um, and so here we are about two and a half years later with a plan and an expectation to close in June of this year. I'd like to thank you for uh, sharing the MWB status on all of this. In terms of the uh, cooperative tenants, um, why are they in one building versus the original buildings they came from? So the, the buildings had five and five families, so five in each building. Um, through conversations with former council member Rosie Mendez um, and her team, uh, the residents expressed some concern about moving uh, back into their buildings and, and feeling like they may be half of the new occupancy, so feeling like they may, may be a minority in their own building. Um, and so with the support of the council member, they actually wrote to HPD requesting that they, they all move together into 204 Avenue A, um, which is the building with the commercial space, so they have that added benefit to, to help finance their operational costs, um, which left 12th Street vacant. Um, it's, it's a little more difficult, it's a little more costly to create new co-ops, so we decided that 12th Street would, would be that uh, rental. Um, and really what we have here, just to touch on the financing, because this is a pretty expensive project, it's more expensive than we typically see in ANCP, um, what we have here is a rental building that's really financing uh, the cost and the affordability of the co-op building. Um, so both building, it will, 12th Street will go through Housing Connect, as Juan mentioned, so it will be a lottery process, um, but essentially what, what we have here are, is one building subsidizing the other. Uh what are the hard costs on the project? So the hard costs are $9.5 million, which is approximately 67% of the budget. And what are the soft costs? The soft costs are $4.6 million, which is about 33% of the budget. And what is the developer fee? Developer fee here is k. It's in line with the ANCP term sheet. Um, we, we negotiate the fee, but it's up to 10% of total development cost. Is there a developer concession or deferral? Can you elaborate? Is the developer taking their full 10% or what have you, or is it um, in the previous project <laughs> the developer had a deferral? We are deferring half the fee at construction loan closing. Um, in anticipation of the permanent loan conversion when the full fee will be dispersed. The location, it is very hard to find affordable office, uh, not office space, commercial space, mm -hmm. uh, especially in this neighborhood. Uh, will there be any restrictions on the rent so that a mom and pop can afford to use it or is it going to be like $10,000 if somebody, 10000 a month to somebody to rent that space? Um, our market analysis shows that we could obtain about $75 a square foot for this particular location. Um, but what we actually uh, include in our budget is no more than a quarter of the total commercial space. Uh, the total of total revenue should come from commercial revenue. So we are restricting it in the budget. So we do have some leeway um, in where we actually set the rent. 
Okay. So you will hopefully set it so that we, we don't need another Starbucks in that part of the city. Mm -hmm. Or a bank. Uh, okay. Um, you answered a lot of the questions. Uh, I think the remaining questions are, are the standard questions relating to uh, uh, the, the construction work, whether the folks doing the construction work and operating the building will have health insurance, whether they have disability insurance, and if they'll have a, a vehicle to retire? Um, so, I mean, I've got a tentative agreement with a general contractor right now. Um, I've, you know, I've been talking to a few people and nobody really kind of, the, the, the site, it, it, it's not a big construction project, so it doesn't really, it's not demanding a, a, a lot of interest. Um, and so, uh, we haven't really talked about about wage rates and benefits for for employees, um, but I imagine you know that could be part of the conversation. You know, it's important to me. I mean, I think it it, it, it makes sense. Um, but just gonna be very realistic with you. It's gonna, you know, like Christine said, it's already a very expensive project in terms just terms of the constructability, um, and so you know the. The retirement benefits is probably going to be a stretch. I mean, I, I could see how health benefits may be part of the equation for the contractor, but I just don't know if, you know, retirement benefits are necessarily something that could make it into something the scale. Do you, do you have access to a 401k or 403b or other retirement vehicle? I don't. I don't. So I'm an independent uh, oh, wow. LLC. So I, uh, I have an, an IRA that I fund for the for myself okay um, I don't you know but I, I hear what you're saying sure a and to HPD uh, it sounds like we've got a developer who's interested in paying people a higher wages so that the people working on the project won't make the affordable housing crisis worse are you able to add additional subsidies so that we're paying people the rates they need so that they don't need to come back to HPD for more affordable housing. We're not. Uh, we will, I imagine we will continue this conversation. I, I get that that was the most definitive response I've ever received from you or HPD. Can you please elaborate? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly on this project, as we've mentioned, it's already, you know, above what we target for term sheets on these mm -hmm. projects. Um, certainly isn't any more room in the budget on this one. How, how can we get to a place where HPD is considering whether or not those working on the project will they themselves need affordable housing and whether or not we're I, I guess the, the, the larger question, so we, we, do we agree that there is a, an affordable housing crisis? We do. And do we agree that if we pay people more, they will not need as much of that affordable housing? I, that, that is one of the key elements. We can build more and we can also, that, that one solution is building more affordable housing, another solution is paying people more. I think it is all part of an equation. I think, you know, it's unfortunately not going to be just about paying people more if you don't actually have safe and quality housing for people to live in. Would you agree that if we pay people more, they have more access to more housing options? Sure, but that, you know, that still doesn't solve the supply question. Sure. I guess my concern is just, that, as you've heard at many hearings before, and uh, we, we will discuss at many hearings after this Absolutely. one, the, how, how many folks are we expecting to, are you expecting to employ on this project? I mean, th frankly, it's not going to be a lot. I mean, I think the, the biggest trade here will be carpentry, and I, I would expect that we would have probably five or six carpenters here working the longest, yeah. you know, for the, the, the longest duration. I mean, uh, the trades here are going to be pretty compact. I mean, we've, you know, there's going to be, you know, it's going to be hard enough to kind of have people working on top of each other just to, to get mm -hmm. through it. We've got 25 feet to work with. It's not, you know, um, there's not a lot of opportunity. I think, you know, just to reiterate Christine's point, um, what the challenge with this project, and I think uh, HP, I, under, I understand HPD's uh, dilemma is that the, you have really one, 
building paying for the cost of two. I mean, I think it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be um, discounted or forgotten that the, the 10 returning households are, are basically purchasing brand new apartments for $2,500. Mm-hmm. So a lot of that, you know, that, the, a lot of that cost is 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 there is is being absorbed by them? If there was a way to offset that, I think there might be an ability for HPD to have some more flexibility. But that is, and th- and that's kind of unprecedented. I, I think you don't really see that where you're getting because each unit is going to cost probably on the order of half a million dollars just to build. So then they're going to get that for twenty five hundred dollars. You know, I, so I, I I see it more frequently than most. Okay. I, I guess the question is, so they're going to get an apartment for twenty five hundred. That's having been displaced from their home for what will be have been 13 years in a in another till building I guess now is this a windfall do they get to turn around and sell it for a million dollars or is it something where they're gonna have to be a co-op owner they're gonna be paying maintenance they're gonna have sweat equity they're they've already likely have sweat equity and where there will be a, a, an incentive not to just sell their unit and even when they do, will there be income restrictions? Yes. So this is an ANCP co-op. Um, every co-op created through ANCP has a flip tax schedule. We apply the same flip tax schedule. It can also be called a profit sharing schedule. So that means that at any point when a purchaser sells, they will recoup what they paid for, uh, 2500 They will also recoup closing costs, which is usually about 13% of uh, the sale price. Um, And then the profit over and above is subject to a percentage that's split between the co-op and the seller. Um, The longer they stay, the more they keep. Uh, In year 15, they actually max out. They'll get 80% of the profit, and then the other 20 comes back to the co-op to help um, pay down debt and also go into the reserves of the co-op. Thank you. In terms of the operations of the building, will those folks have health insurance disability or a retirement uh, the so the um, the cooperative like like was stated before I, I will solicit uh, proposals from a qualified property manager got it um, and then that property manager will will be you know on the hook for a year at least I mean uh, there'll be a thirty day out or something like that but if it really doesn't work out and then the you know it was, so we'll set a budget for the first year of operations which will you know we'll 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 speak to. Uh, uh, staffing levels and whatever benefits that the property manager thinks are commensurate with the market, um, and then the you know ultimately the co-op will take over, and then they'll decide whether or not they can continue that or afford that. And then you know, I, I'll probably do, a, and it'll probably be a similar approach for the rental building. Frankly speaking, I mean I don't see a need to do two different property managers. Mm-hmm. I've so I've, I've I've worked in this neighborhood with this kind of uh, smaller project mix. For a couple of years now, um, and what I found is that there really isn't a lot of I learned a lot of a lot of takers for these affordable cooperatives. Um, they're 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 kind of um, regulatory uh, heavy in terms of reporting, mm-hmm. um, and so um, and uh, you know and then there are some challenges in terms of the 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 the, the residents kind of transitioning from being re- long term renters to, to cooperative <laughs> owners. And so, um, you know, it, it kind of limits your options. But you know, I, I think whatever the whatever the market um, is 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 offering, I think is is fair in terms of these are you know you're not going to get a, a large property manager that's going to want to take a run at a 10 unit co-op or an 11 unit rental. So it's going to be a, a small small players. You know, community board three asked me the same question, and I said uh-huh. I'd be happy to open it up to you know to local local like their their thing was like local nonprofit. Like local nonprofit property managers, and I and I and I was very frankly I was very frank with them. I did a, a similar cooperative conversion rehab project a few years ago, and I opened it up to uh, nonprofit manager bidders, but they didn't ultimately didn't bid on it. On it. So, um, you know, I'll I'm more than happy to, to offer the opportunities to folks, and if they you know if, if they Speaking what they of want. Local opportunities. You may have heard my favorite question that I get to ask: Does your project have a local hire requirement? Um, oh, we, uh, I'll be subject to hire NYC. Great. So uh, if somebody is uh, watching at home right now, they live in the Lower East Side and they are interested in being one of those five carpenters or uh, one of those few folks on these uh, small sites that can help build something in their neighborhood, 
Uh, what numbers should they call? Well, if I can't give them fo your phone number, I'll give them mine. Okay. <laughs> okay. So it's right here. Um, so I, I mean, I'll I'll be, you know, uh, so I've been working with the, the council member's office pretty uh, pretty extensively for a couple of years now, um, and so uh, and I have a very open line of communication with uh, council member Rivera's office on this project in particular and um, so people should feel free should to call, feel call, 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 call the council Leo member Rivera. who put me in touch with um, or and then I've you know like I said I've been I've been into the record correct and I've been doing some projects in in the neighborhood already so folks are see me walking around the, around the neighborhood a lot and, and so what you've displayed for the public and what will be scanned into the record is so you can you can reach Juan at 646-644-0449 let them know you are watching this on uh, TV or online and that you're interested in working on putting these buildings up. Uh, I want to thank you. Uh, is there any member of the public who would like to testify on these items? Uh, seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on land use item 329 and the application will be laid over. This concludes today's hearing. I would like to thank the council and land use staff for preparing today's hearing and the members of the public and my colleagues for attending. This meeting is hereby adjourned.